All right, we've reached that quiet point where everybody seems to think we're going to do something here. So uh, not even interrupting when I uh, welcome you all in. So first of all, thank you all for coming out today. And I want to say a few things about today's talk and today's speaker. First of all, today's talk is sponsored by our campus-wide provost-sponsored University of Michigan Foundational Course Initiative. Most of you know about that, but I'll just say a few words about it. Through the FCI, teams of disciplinary faculty, students, and staff join together with CRLT instructional consultants, and their goal is to transform large courses from what they sometimes are today, weed out filters for students, through which some survive, to maybe deep roots gardens in which everyone will thrive. That's certainly the kind of goal that I have in my mind for this. Since its launch, um, in 2017, the FCI has welcomed in 11 courses in topics from introductory physics and math to business, the art of the film, and public health. And there will be another round of those courses coming in this year, and the intent is to continue to do that year after year after year. The FCI here at Michigan is one example of the many course reform efforts which are underway at large public universities across the country. And last year, in 2018, we launched an effort here at Michigan to bring together some of these parallel efforts and launched the Sloan Equity and Inclusion in STEM Introductory Courses, or Seismic Project. What Seismic does is to bring together existing reform efforts on 10 large public university campuses in a sustained, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary STEM education research and development collaboration. The idea of this collaboration is motivated entirely by a focus on equity and inclusion in large foundational courses as the central goal of the STEM reform process. We, we believe that if we do that really well, many other great things will have to happen along the way. So focusing on that. Um, we think this also helps us to harness a higher level of collective passion from all the people who are involved, including the students themselves, but also faculty, staff, and administrators who want to support this. When we go forward and say we want to improve student learning by a little bit in this class, it has one kind of resonance for students when we say we want to make this an inclusive environment in which everyone can thrive. It has a different kind of resonance. That's very important. We also are hoping to define a new standard for STEM reform projects to say, you know, a class can't be great unless it's equitable and inclusive. Seismic's member institutions include Michigan and Michigan State, Purdue, Indiana, Minnesota, Arizona State, Pittsburgh, UC Davis, UC Santa Barbara, and UC one of our most important goals in Seismic is to learn from and with one another. And one way we do that is through the exchange of ideas, a steady exchange of ideas, carried usually embodied in individuals who come to our campus unless they bring ideas to us. So for this purpose, every Seismic institution has agreed to host at least six speakers a year from the other institutions, which brings us to today's guest, Dr. Brian Sato, Professor of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry and Associate Dean in the Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation at UC Irvine. Dr. Sato earned his undergraduate degree in molecular and cell biology at Berkeley in 2003 and his PhD in cell biology at UC San Diego in 2008. He's a pioneer in STEM education, doing work which extends from the details of student understanding and study skills in intro bio classes at Irvine across the landscape of higher education, including all the different disciplines of STEM education at Irvine. He is helping the community to recognize, I think one important thing he's doing is helping the community to recognize the central importance of teaching faculty in, achi in, in achieving really long thought after sustainable reform. I know I've already learned a lot from Ryan and his work, and I'm thrilled that you all have a chance to hear some of this today as well. His title, Building a Change Ecosystem, Leveraging the Institution to Improve STEM Education. Please join me and welcome him, Ryan. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for all of you for coming out here. I don't know if, if at Irvine we'd have this many people coming out to hear a talk about teaching and, and education. And so I think what you guys have already building in terms of the culture, we have a lot to learn from as well. I also appreciate you guys waited for your first snow for me to come out here. <laughs> I, it was literally 80 degrees when I left Irvine. <laughs> and normally when I travel, I don't bother looking at the weather because I just figure, well, it's 80 degrees in Irvine, so it's 80 degrees everywhere. But I, I actually did look. And so I had a jacket that I had to take my tags off of that I <laughs> that's been in my closet for over a year. Just you do keep loaders here at CRLT, right? <laughs> Loader jackets, just in case. Uh, so I've given the research version of this talk uh, a handful of times, and so that's the title of, of that. Um, 
But I thought for, for the purpose of this, so I'll show you some of the data we have and some of the things, I'll describe some of the programs we have on our campus. But I really wanted to frame this in the sense of what you guys have going on on your campus, that you are going to have an active learning building in a couple of years. And so sharing some of the things that, that we've done, but also getting you to start thinking about what do we need to do to be prepared for that and, and make it as successful as possible. Uh, a little bit about uh, what's going on today, so a little bit about active learning, some stuff that we specifically done at UCI, and then thinking more towards assessment and how are you going to quantify the success of what you have going on on your campus. Um, I wanted to be good, so I wrote a, a bunch of learning objectives, <laughs> uh, which I emailed you, and, and if you want to read these at some point, I can send you the slides. Over. Before I jump into my stuff, though, I want to get a, a quick idea of who's here and sort of uh, what you'd like to get out of this. So maybe if you could just give your name and, and where you're from on campus and maybe a very quick blurb, because there's a lot of you here, but a quick blurb about what you hope to gain in the next hour and a half or so. That's great. So we have a ton of really uh, varied perspectives here. And I, what I want you to, to sit here and, and get out of this is I want you to learn something that, that's valuable for you, that whatever your particular role is, I want you to think about this talk and, and this topic in the context of what you hope to get out of it. Hopefully I'll be able to hit a lot of the things that, that were mentioned here. So as Tim mentioned, I'm a, a professor of teaching in biological sciences, so I, I teach the big 400 person lectures and, and some smaller classes as well. But much of what I'm going to present today is in the context of my administrative role as associate dean for a division of teaching excellence and innovation. So let me give you a little overview of what that is. So we have uh, one group involved in faculty instructional development, and that's led by our director, Andrea Aversold, and uh, much of what we talk about today will be work that, that she has put on. Um, Danny Mann is our director of graduate and postdoc instructional development, so we have a lot of programming to prepare future faculty uh, for the classroom and, and careers in academia. Uh, Matt Williams, who is our principal analyst for learning environments and technology. So basically, he's the classroom space person. He's uh, had a lot to do with our new building, but there's also a lot of work we're doing on campus to refresh old classrooms and, and modify seating arrangements and things like that in those, and he's involved in those discussions. Megan Linos uh, is in charge of online education, so creating online courses as well as uh, digital learning and, and helping in traditional face-to-face -face classes as well. And then uh, we have a teaching and learning research center who used to have a person there, Adrian Williams, who has since gone on to a faculty position on our campus. And so I am sort of that blob right there for now, but we hope to find a new person in the future. And so we do a lot of things on our, on our campus to help change the culture around teaching and learning. Uh, we've done a lot to help faculty gain access to institutional data, and we've used your campus as an example of how to do that, as well as places like Davis. Um, but really this idea that we have a treasure trove of data about our students, how can we get that into the hands of faculty so they can make meaningful changes in their classroom? Uh, we have a pedagogical fellows program, or this really intensive year-long program for graduate students uh, where they learn a lot about uh, teaching and, and designing courses and, and mentorship and things like that to help prepare them for their future careers. Uh, we've got a first-year course project that is much uh, smaller and, and much more in its earlier phases than what you guys have here, but so we identified about 15 classes on our campus that I think 95% of our first year students take one or more of these when they come in in the fall. And so we're using this as an opportunity to hit them with some sort of common messaging. And so we're starting with some stuff on study skills to hopefully influence them in a positive way. Um, and we're really trying to get our faculty more engaged with education research um, and, and recognizing that this is a way that they can get scholarship and it can be used to help them in terms of promotions and merits and, and whatnot. So I'm not going to have time to talk about these things, um, but I'd be happy to discuss them at a, at a later time. What I'm going to talk about here is our role in trying to increase the use of active learning on campus and really get faculty prepared to do this and get faculty invested uh, to doing this. And so before we sort of talk about the, the steps that we're taking, the question is, well, why are we bothering to do that to begin with? Why is there this big push for active learning to begin with? And there's a few different perspectives you could look at. So one is that data seems to support that active learning is better. So many of you may have seen this meta-analysis from Scott Freeman's group, 
where they looked at 200 plus different uh, papers that, that looked at the impact of active learning and they found overall there was an increase uh, in, in a variety of things, one of them being, uh, I guess in this case, a decrease of failure rates for students in classes that uh, use active learning. Um, I think uh, another perspective you can look at this is in terms of the, the faculty perspective. I personally use active learning because it makes my life easier. So traditionally if I had a 50 minute lecture, I'd have 50 minutes of material that I would have ready to go. And I essentially had a little script I used to write on the, the chalkboard when we had chalkboards. I had the whole thing diagrammed out and it was like this whole presentation, this whole thing that I had to go through in order to be ready for class. Now when I teach, I have my 15 minutes or so of material that I'm going to lecture on, the rest of the time is active learning, and so there's little to no prep time required at all. I figure out, okay, here are the things that I'm going to talk about today, and I just sort of walk in and the students do all the work. I think the other perspective you think about is in the context of learning, that I think about this all the time, that, that a typical lecture is the most bizarre thing in the world, like where else in our lives do we ever learn the way that we learn in a new university setting. There's never a case where you sit there and have someone tell stuff to you, and then you store that in your brain and you tell it back to them uh, later. It's all about you finding out information. It's all about collaboration. It's all about uh, working together and, and, and really being the one that uh, finds the information rather than having someone deliver it to you. So I think there's ample evidence, but there's also personal experience. And, and really, in terms of teaching, teaching is very personal that what you guys do in the classroom is, is really based on what you feel is best. And so everyone can talk about the data until they're blue in the face, but that's not what's gonna convince you. And so I think creating a culture like this where you come together and you talk about teaching, that's how you're gonna start uh, spreading these ideas and, and hopefully leading to more active learning on your campus. Now that being said, it, it sounds all well and good. Do more active learning, because you'll feel better. Uh, but there are clearly a lot of barriers to implementing active learning. So I want you guys to start with, you have little worksheets on your table. Um, the first question is this, what are the barriers to implementing active learning? So maybe take like two minutes on your own and jot some thoughts down and then you can share them. All right, so I think I'm gonna stop everyone now. So I walked around, lots of great discussions going on. Um, one thing I want to say is that all of these barriers that, that have been discussed and that you wrote down, these are all very valid things. I think one issue is that when folks who do active learning come around, they say, why aren't you doing active learning? What's wrong with you? And when people say, well, it's because of A, B, and C, they sort of, ah, that's not a real thing. Just go do active learning. And so everything that, and we'll, we'll discuss some of the ideas that, that came up at your tables, but all these are real barriers. And it's a question of how do we get around these barriers? And I think. Part of it has to do with teaching and learning centers and what they can provide, and so our, our professional development component around active learning tries to address many of these barriers. Um, some of them have to come from the institution, and the institution has to recognize that these are barriers and uh, find ways for instructors to get around them. So let's, what do we want to start with? What is one barrier that, that your table came up with? Yeah. Ways to assess student success. How okay. do they learn through? Okay. I'm sure. Sure. Okay. So the idea of does assessment change when you do active learning? That and, and, it, and it absolutely does. That you want to be able to say that when you go through this course experience, whatever it is you do in your lecture and outside of lecture, that has to align with assessments. So you can't say, well, here's how I traditionally tested students, and now we're going to shift what they do in the class and use those same sort of assessments. So you have to modify. It what's going on there and you have to be cognizant of that. What else? Yeah? We talked even before um, getting started, just perceptions on, on the part of faculty and departments, whether it's rigorous or not, how do you do it, um, whether it's um, valuable for the students, whether students are going to push back. Right, so perceptions both in terms of the faculty, perceptions in terms of the students. So, from the faculty perspective, if you're saying I'm going to do active learning, there are some folks in the department that are going to sort of snicker when they hear that. And we hear that in my department that we had our new building and things like that and people sort of, there are some that are clearly in one camp versus the other. So it's a cultural shift on the faculty perspective. It's absolutely a cultural shift from the student perspective as well. But if it's one thing to say, okay, every class on our campus is now going to be active learning. They're going to 
students will experience the same thing from class to class. But when it's 10% of our classes are going to have active learning, and the students hit your class, and that's the only one where they see it, or maybe two classes, then it, it's very different. And so on our particular campus, we have a decent amount of active learning going on, but it's still in the minority. And so you will get a lot of self-selection in terms of the students and, and where they go. They know that this section has active learning, and some students like that, and they go there, and, and other students don't, so they'll go to more traditional classes as well. Um, it was pointed out the table that because active learning requires both a change in pedagogy and uh, really kind of forward-looking uh, design of the learning experience, that there's a really high entry bar. And Absolutely. that makes it hard to pay that price unless you know it's going to be sustained for a long time. And oftentimes it's not. I'll make my class awesome and then I'll stop teaching and it's not. Yeah, and so that is true. And so I said before, well, my life is... My easier. classes aren't awesome, but in theory... <laughs> Um, so when I said active learning for me is personally easier, it's personally more easier today. It wasn't when I first started building the courses, right? And, and so, I'm already, so I've been at Irvine for almost 10 years now, and I'm already at the point where it's like, I don't want to change anything. So when I came in, I said, hey, we should be teaching like this, this, and this, and faculty would say, I don't want to change what I'm doing. And I'd say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you want to change? And I'm already at that point that I'm like, I'm set. I'm never going to teach a different way again. Uh, which isn't completely true, but there is that, that high activation energy. And so one of the things that I would say there is you don't have to transform your entire course in, in one fell swoop. That it could be this quarter, we're going to add one thing to every third lecture. Maybe. And that way you're doing exactly what you did before. Maybe you're spending a little time building that one thing. And then over the course of many, many years, if, if you find that you like it, you can slowly add more and more. I wonder if anybody thought about... Um it, it, the first thing that was raised was evaluate, how do we evaluate student learning or success within an active learning class, but broad, more broadly, we didn't talk about it, but the barrier that we generally gauge student success by their course grades mm -hmm. overall, that maybe we're not presenting enough compelling evidence that you should definitely be moving to active learning because there's some gap in what we measure as success. Right, so, I mean, we could have a a very long discussion about grading in general yeah. and what in the world do grades mean. I mean. We know what they, we think they mean. We think they mean that if a student gets a 94, that they know more than the student who got an 87, who knows more than the student who got an 83. Um, if we think about that, we're really just sort of tricking ourselves into saying that, yeah, of course, that's because our whole world would collapse if we realized that that's not actually what we're measuring. Um, but, right, so the question is, is anything wrong to begin with? Students are getting grades, students are graduating, students are going off to graduate school, they're getting jobs. The system seems to be working pretty well. I think the one compelling argument there is that there's definitely a difference in which types of students are succeeding. Well. And that, that the fact that those gaps exist between underrepresented students, between first-gen students, between low-income students, might mean that the current system is not allowing for, for equal opportunities for success for everybody. And there's a lot in the literature uh, that hints that active learning might be better for those kinds of students. And there's a lot of sort of uh, sociology type work to think about, well, what is the role of culture in a student's life and, and why bringing that culture to the classroom might be more valuable to them and, and more possible in an active learning environment. So there seems to be a lot of uh, evidence pointing to the fact that active learning is going to be better for certain kinds of students who don't traditionally succeed. Okay. Around all of this is the reward system in the academy, um, especially at research universities. Yep. Um, that this idea that I want to put my effort someplace that's going to continue, I also want to put my effort someplace where I think it's going to be rewarded. Absolutely. And, and what what seem if you're a tenure track faculty, if you're a lecturer, and how much say do you have in in, um, in curriculum and the way things get taught? Um, I think that that's a big institutional piece. Um, that that is, it goes along with how you evaluate teaching over reliance on student grade. There's, there's a whole bunch of naughty issues connected to that. Right. So one of the key things there is how one evaluates teaching excellence, and nobody knows how to do that well. So we know how we do it. We do it with student evaluation, but we know there's a ton of issues with student evaluation, and so folks have put a lot of thought into, well, maybe we should have peer evaluations, maybe we should have teaching statements and things like that. But there are plenty of issues with those. As well. So again, that is a major issue in general, and then in the context of, of changing how you teach at a, at 
at a, at a research university. So yeah, one, at the end of the day, tenure track faculty in a research institution are evaluated based on their research. And so they can spend time on their teaching. And one argues, well, it's about the students, shouldn't you care about the students? And every single faculty member on this campus cares about the students. But they also recognize there's only so many hours in the day, and if you're going to be rewarded for this and not this, it just doesn't make sense for you to think about that. And so that's part of the institutional piece, that the institution has to recognize that teaching is something we truly value. It's not that we expect you to invent four more hours in the day, it's that we are going to say teaching is meaningful, and here's how we're going to reward it in a I think there's also some very specific uh, pieces in place, especially around uh, foundational introductory courses, uh, as far as how they are staffed, um, that makes it difficult to have a coherent, sustainable system. Um, I mean, oftentimes it's just rotated through people. Mm -hmm. Who knows doing it? Who knows what experience they have? Um, how do you build a course that another person can come into that then they have any familiarity with active learning? Are they focused on, like, I just have to cover the content, all the content, every content ever, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and then there's the issues around, uh, um, you know, you get a grant and you buy out time. So, oh, you were going to be teaching, but month before, somebody else was slotted in there because you're no longer out of that slot. So, um, how do you um, develop things that anybody working with has a framework which to continue that activity? Right, and so that has to go to the culture piece as well. That at least on our campus, how teaching is assigned in every department is unique to that department. So, there are some, some departments that highly uh, rely on non tenure track lectures, and those are people that literally get hired two weeks before the quarter starts. There are others where you have people who have taught that class for 30 years, and there's no way you're telling that person who's taught for 30 years that they're going to do something different. There's the case of, for these intro courses, generally there are multiple sections. So if one of them is going to switch to active learning, how does that impact the other one? So there are a whole lot of discussions that, that need to be had at the institution level, at the department level, um, and, and with individuals teaching a, a common course together. I think we also have to recognize the issue around our spaces. And we have lots of great faculty who can teach using active learning techniques and pedagogies in the worst spaces ever. However, it's difficult to convince faculty to change and know that they are being supported and invested in that change if we have spaces that you know students can't move or even turn around and talk to each other. Um, the spaces that really should only have 35 students and have 70. Mm -hmm. right? And and. We struggle against that here because we just don't have enough classrooms and classroom spaces to really change yeah. and to make radical change. So it, it becomes a chicken and an egg issue then. And it's, it's not necessarily the biggest barrier, but it is a barrier. Yeah, so it's absolutely a barrier, this idea that students have to talk to each other, but they can't really move and, and turn to their neighbors. For really successful active learning, you need to have facilitators that can walk around and talk to people if they're in the middle of a giant road and there's no way you can get to them. Um, the classroom space one is one that I've always sort of thumbed my nose down, like, no, no, that's not a real barrier. Because I, I started doing active learning in, in a large sort of traditional auditorium type classroom. But moving into an active learning space, like it's night and day, there's a clear difference between uh, not only what you can physically do, but also the buy-in from the instructor as well as from the students. That when they sit in a room that's like, oh, we're at tables like this, I guess we actually have to talk to each other. So there's that immediate change in perspective. And it also really highlights the institutional commitment. Like the, if the institution is saying, hey, go to active learning in my 500-person auditorium, then they may be saying it, but they're clearly not backing it up with, with actual resources. I've got an issue with inclusion. You speak of uh, doing this in a large classroom, and I break them into teams and groups to talk, and invariably it's a small portion of those teams actually do the talking, mm -hmm. and unfortunately it's often the males yep. who are doing it. So if I want everyone to be included in that, I'm not sure how to manage that in a large lecture hall. Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely a good point as well. So one of the things that, so I've been doing active learning for five or ten years now, and one of the things I never started doing until this past year was talking about the, the ground rules for group work. So I would say, 
talk to your neighbors and assume that the students know how to do that. But no one really teaches you how to work in groups, right? That's just something you sort of figure out. So all through life, you'll have to work through in groups, and you're just told, hey, go in there and work in groups. And so it's important that you lay ground rules that, hey, everyone has to have an opportunity to speak. Um, everyone's perspective is important. Everyone, you can't be monopolizing the conversation. A lot of times what some people do is actually assign roles to different people. So you're the note taker and you're the discussion leader and so on, and you rotate those to make sure everyone gets their ideas. Uh, there are also things, so for example, in engineering, I know the, the gender issue is, is a big deal. And so to make sure if you're assigning groups that you don't have a group where just a female is alone in that group surrounded by males, that you make sure that it's either multiple females or no females in that group, and that can often create more uh, diverse discussions that way. Well, I think it's bigger than that, because there are students who are just uncomfortable. They don't feel like they belong, sure. whether they're female or not. And so that could, be, that could be another issue in terms of underrepresented students, that if you, so on our campus, about a quarter of our students are Hispanic, and so making sure that, that you don't have a Hispanic student by themselves in that particular group. I think the facilitators also help there as well. So rather than leaving everyone just to talk by themselves, we have uh, TAs and, and, and learning assistants walking around, talking to the groups, and, and if they notice a particular person isn't talking, they'll come up and say, well, what do you think about this, this idea? So there's no way to make it perfect, particularly because people have unique personalities and, and various buy-in to, to group work. But there are ways that you could make it better. Uh, is the same thing, so like how much guidance you provide versus like how much information? It seems like at our table we talked about a few undergrad classes and they need a little bit more hand holding, a little bit more information. Um, I feel like I experienced the opposite sitting on some grad level classes and uh, feedback from students was that um, you know, I'm not sure it was interjecting too much, providing too much information, not enough time to sit and think. They wanted to discuss and like formulate their own thoughts beforehand. Um, so yeah. you feel for what you're, you know, where you feel. That's so that's definitely something too that you have to figure out what your role as the instructor is in a classroom. And I think uh, that has a lot to do with experience. And that's something that it's not just I'm going to design this activity. It's figuring out what is your role in this activity. And that's something that I think you sort of uh, get through trial and error. Uh, I think the other piece there is getting student buy-in. So I definitely noticed at the beginning of my class the students are less likely to talk to each other as, as a few weeks later. And so really making sure the students understand that here is why we do active learning. Like they don't care about that graph about failure rate. They, they assume they're in the passing no matter what. So really saying here is why we're doing this. Here, this is how you're going to learn for the rest of your life. This is how you're going to go off and, and when you go to your job, this is how your everyday is going to be. It's going to be talking to, to other people. It's going to be building uh, on each other's ideas. It's about finding information on your own. Um, one common complaint that I get on my student evaluations is that what I do is not teaching. Why doesn't he teach more? He's not teaching anything. And so I spend a lot of time trying to build that idea with them that here is why I do it the way that I do it. And, and it's, this, here's why I think this is valuable. And here's what I think your role is in the classroom. You're not going to get everyone to buy in. But there definitely has to be that piece to it that you are making sure that, that students are aware of. Take one more. Well, I actually have a question. When, when you talk about active learning, what, what is you defining as active learning? Because I think a lot of people have misconceptions of what active learning is. I mean, some people think it's all about theatrics. Other people think it's about just having them discuss. But there's a whole continuum of things that you can do. So I would define active learning in my classroom as student group work, students getting the opportunity to not only think independently about a problem, but then to collaboratively discuss that problem with their peers. Um, there's definitely a role for the instructor in that I'm going to sort of summarize that discussion at the end of the day, but it's going to involve student uh, input. It's going to involve student work. That if, if students are used to the thing where they just sort of sit there and, and absorb and don't play a, a role in the classroom, that's going to be different in my class, and they're going to physically and mentally have to exert something that, that they maybe wouldn't in the traditional All right, so hopefully I'll touch on some of these points uh, through my slides. But again, these are all very valid issues. And so some of these things are things that your teaching center can help with, but some of these things are, are things that the institution is absolutely going to have to commit to resolving. And so that's sort of that's how you're going to gauge whether or not Michigan really wants active learning to happen. So if, if they're not going to reward faculty who, who 
switch and things like that, those are those are signs that maybe this is something that they're only doing in theory. I don't think that's the case, particularly because of the culture you guys have on this campus, but those are discussions you definitely want to have um, as you get close to opening this brand. So. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what, what we're doing to increase activity on our campus. So we have this new building, the ELK, or the Anteater Learning Pavilion, so our mascot is the Anteater, hence <laughs> Anteater Pavilion. Uh, we also created an active learning institute around uh, this. And, and one of the reasons uh, that we're pushing active learning so much is because we have a really diverse student body. So we're close to 50% first gen, uh, about a third of our students are underrepresented minorities. And so, and, and despite the fact that based on national rankings and things like that, we, we seem to be doing pretty good, uh, we definitely see a disparity in who's graduating. And, and in the context of STEM, we see a disparity in terms of who's graduating with a STEM degree, uh, as well as who's changing majors and, and who's moving to social sciences and, and things like that. And so we want to make sure that, that our, our students have uh, equal opportunities for success. So this is our fancy new building. It opened a year ago. And uh, part of the reason that I think this is a great time for me to come talk to you guys is because you have a couple years lead time until your building opens. Uh, I started my administrator role maybe five months before the building opened. So a lot of those discussions about what the building was going to be and, and how we were going to use that, those discussions had happened before I showed up. Um, but one of the big things I pushed was, well, we need to assess what's going on. And so we've cobbled together this assessment plan, and we're, we're developing it um, from there. But in theory, you have two years to think about this. Uh, probably five months before you realize, oh, crap, we have a building opening in five months. Um, but at least maybe you have the opportunity to think more than, than I had. Um, the building has two large lecture halls. So we have a 250-person and a 400-person lecture hall. These lecture halls are fairly traditional in appearance. There's a front to them, uh, there's, there's rows, it's auditorium seating. Some of the distinctions are there's space between the rows, so instructors and, and TAs and stuff can walk up and down the rows. The chairs swivel, so you can talk to the people in front of you or behind you. Uh, but other than that, it, it looks pretty much like a traditional lecture hall. We have uh, rooms that anywhere from 60 to 100 students that are set up in these pods, groups of six or eight, and each has a fancy little TV monitor uh, attached to it. So students can display things on those monitors as they work together. The instructor can display them on the main projector. Uh, again, there's a front to the room, so there are some active learning classrooms where there's no front. And so the instructor sort of stands in the middle and, and talks around them, and it can be sort of jarring for, for faculty. And we wanted to make sure that all faculty would feel comfortable in these rooms, whether or not they were using active learning, they could, they could walk into this room and not be immediately scared. We do have one room on campus that was open before this where it was that sort of groups in a circle and the faculty in the middle sort of just walking around in, in a circle, spinning around, trying to talk to them. And there were plenty of instructors who would show up the first day and say, I'm out of here. We are not having class in here anymore. So we wanted to make sure that students would, or faculty would at least be comfortable uh, teaching in these rooms. We have smaller rooms as well that fit 30 students that have these little mobile chairs that uh, they can then bring together to form little desks that they work on together. Uh, we also, which is fairly unique for our classroom spaces, is there's a lot of informal uh, study places as well. So pretty much every building on our campus, every classroom building on our campus is just classrooms and bathrooms. And so once you're done with class, you don't have to go to the bathroom, you just sort of disperse uh, across. But we have, we have all these seating areas, we have these little ant caves that students can reserve. And so pretty much from like 8 in the morning until 10 at night, students are in there. It's all about the branding, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, we also have, like I mentioned, an active learning institute. And so Andrea put this together. And uh, they are eight 90 minute sessions. So they happen every other week. So it's a 15 week commitment for faculty to sign up. Uh, 30 participants per institute. And the one little carrot we gave them is mm. if you become active learning certified, you get priority scheduling in the new building. And so the way our scheduling works is that the, prior, the, the people who are certified get slotted in there first. Once we go through that, then anyone else get in, in the empty spaces gets slotted in there. Um, it focuses a lot on getting buy-in. So the very first piece, or the very first class meeting of the Institute is this discussion on barriers. What is keeping you from doing active learning? How can we try to remedy that? 
gets them to think a lot about their own current practices and what they do in the classroom. Um, they spend time thinking about course design, because oftentimes our faculty have never gotten real professional development around teaching, and so this might be the first opportunity where they see some of that. Um, they get to practice some active learning activities. Uh, they learn about inclusive teaching. And then at the end, what they do is they get observed, and they have to hit a, a certain threshold in order to be considered uh, certified. The other thing that, that I don't know if we intended when we created this was that it's really created a community uh, on our campus. So we have, I forget, uh, we have 152 participants who have gone through the Institute since spring 2018. And we have these alumni meetings uh, once a quarter to come back and sort of, how are things been going? What sorts of trouble have you run into? And sometimes we have new teaching uh, topics that we discuss. But we'll routinely get 50 faculty coming back to these alumni meetings to sit there and talk. And so this has really become a, a boon for Andrea that when she needs feedback, she has this whole slew of people who want to come back and do more, that we're currently building uh, an Institute 2.0, because a lot of faculty are saying, hey, I want to learn more about some particular topics. Can you design more programming for us? So it's really created this culture on campus. Um, in terms of who's coming, uh, it's about it's split pretty equally across uh, the various levels. We also wanted to make sure that non-tenure track faculty could be part of it as well, that oftentimes uh, lecturers aren't included in professional development opportunities, and that creates a uh, a divide between tenure track and non-tenure track. So we wanted to make sure that all instructors had the opportunity to take the class. Um, about a quarter of these tenure track faculty are, are teaching faculty. So on our campus, teaching faculty are maybe 10% of the tenure track faculty. So they are overrepresented here, but this is clearly not just a teaching faculty thing. The research faculty are, are coming as well. As far as disciplines, uh, we have a, a decent chunk of humanities folks there. One, one concern we've often had is that for humanities instructors, they say, well, we can't do this active learning stuff. It's not for us. But we're, we're getting plenty of buy-in from them, uh, a number of STEM folks as well. So 152 participants, about 30 per cohort. We have yet to have empty seats in, in the institute that up until. So this winter will be another one that's already full. We have a wait list. So we've had a wait list since Andrea opened this back in spring 2018, and she's had to add a couple extra institutes to make sure faculty get through. So we have not exhausted uh, the folks who want to do this, which is perhaps surprising. Uh, that's the obvious question. Is the school education that small, or did you start buying in? <laughs> it, is, it is very small. So the School of Education has maybe 40 faculty compared to the couple thousand faculty we have. Um, I don't think their buy-in is any smaller than any other given department. It's just their their friends. Any other questions? Yeah. A similar comment. We were just observing that business is only two percent, um, and two of our eleven courses are in business. So that kind of stood out to us. But one thing I was um, reflecting: they have a a pretty strong disciplinary culture of case study teaching, which is kind of inherently oh, active already, right? So going back to that kind of teaching culture that's already in place, it yeah, kind of so makes sense that they might not. The, the business know. school, all, I guess this brings up a good point of why did I split them this way, and I don't know why I split them this way. <laughs> um, but, but the business school is also so relatively small, small yeah. compared, to, mm -hmm. compared to the others, so it's not necessarily a, an issue there. Um, we haven't had any specific feedback from the business school that, hey, we already do this, we don't need you guys sort of thing. Um, but it's possible that, that that might be a perception. I'm curious which, if you know anything about which arts and humanities are involved. I mean, I feel like the language is like, that is their thing, right? You can't learn the language passively, basically. Yeah. But are there other ones that are? Um, I don't know of any particular. So I mean, we're getting like dance instructors in there, and we're getting performance <laughs> things in there as well and so I don't I don't think there's any one group that that wouldn't necessarily there hasn't necessarily engaged with us okay. yeah um, so not to backtrack too much but I'm really curious about the certification component of this and how that was perceived by the faculty and the institution mm. and then also how that actually works in terms of like what what is the threshold and how does that how do you guys do that so the so the threshold, 
And to be honest, this is something that I don't know if I 100% stand behind. So Andrea created this where, with that follow-up observation, you have to be, uh, so using COPUS, and I'll talk about COPUS in a second, but using COPUS, you have to be spending less than 50% of your time with the, the lecture code on COPUS. And so there are various other things that, could, that are included um, outside of lecture. It could be student group work. It could be more Socratic lecture back and forth with, with the instructor. My issue with the 50% is that we have no idea what the right amount of active learning is. <laughs> so we don't know if 10% of your class is active learning or 90%. The data says that active learning in general is good, but we don't have a feel for all for at, at all for what the right amount is. And so that is perhaps a, a valid criticism of the 50%. I think her main point is that she just wants to see you doing something besides lecturing. Um, there is a little pushback from faculty who say, oh, I can't possibly do that. But our success rate has been almost 100%. Now, it is sort of biased because they're told, hey, we're coming to your class on this day and you got to do less than 50% lecture. But they at least can demonstrate for one class period they can successfully do this. <laughs> and and they've, they've, they've all pretty much done it. But that is a worry for faculty going in. Um, as far as for the actual... Uh, implementation in terms of once you're certified, how does that affect scheduling? We've looked at the numbers and we have yet to saturate the rooms with certified faculty. So one concern is at some point, we're gonna have more certified faculty than we have space in the building. And I guess we'll worry about that when that happens. As of now, depending on the, the, the size of a classroom, it's anywhere from maybe a third of the faculty to three quarters of the faculty are active learning certified in a given space. Uh, but we are already running into faculty who said, well, I wanted this, and this other instructor wanted this, only one of us could have it. Um, and that's something that will get more common as, as time passes. All right, follow-up to that. So our faculty, is there any sort of guarantee, if you will, that they would, that, that would be sustainable for them if they'd be in that space? There is no guarantee. And fortunately, no one's pressed us. <laughs> but when it happens, too late, you're already certified. How are students responding to that certification? Or are, do they have any idea? Students are fairly oblivious to Well, I mean, there's no reason for them to, to understand the certification process at all, right? So stu students are understanding that, hey, active learning is happening in more classes. Uh, because they talk to each other about who does what, they have an idea of what classes uh, uh, implement active learning. But I don't think they understand the, the certification process, the professional development, the scheduling at all. Yeah. I think one of the things FCI is toyed with um, is like, okay, as courses go through our program, uh, what happens when they've completed it? You know, do we have a certification process? Does it go in some place, like, you know, in, in the, uh, the course guide or something? That. Right, sort of a stamp so, of approval. There. Yeah, you know, there's like some set of expectations. And I think I think that makes sense. I imagine faculty probably wouldn't be thrilled about that because now you've set some sort of expectation that this is going to be an amazing class if you guys enroll, and maybe faculty don't want that pressure. Um, but that is something to that that potentially could be. Yeah. Um, just to kind of add to that, you know, students are skeptical. So a lot of times, faculty they express vulnerability if they convey that this is the first time they're trying an active learning approach. And then sometimes, you know, student this if the professor um, allows for them to be a part of that process, then it gives them agency to also, you know, assist in that learning. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I encourage faculty when they're trying something new to make it clear to the students that students are human beings, most of them are human beings, and so they're, they're generally going to be more receptive and, and more, more forgiving if you sort of lay that out there. Now, that being said, there is always the backlash with the student evaluations and things like that, and I think that's a, another place where the institution has to step in and say, hey, we're going rec to recognize that you did something different and you went out on a limb, we're not going to penalize you for that, or we're going to reward you for that. To penalize you for that. Have you seen any differences in what faculty are willing to say and how vulnerable they want to be based on their own identities? Because I think it carries a different weight 
depending on who you are, sure. as to coming into a class and saying, hey, I'm just trying this. Yeah. If there's already suspicion because mm -hmm. you're not in the majority, then that might actually help you cut things. I think, and, and that's absolutely the case, and that's the issue with student evaluations, right? That students yeah. view different individuals differently right. depending on their identities, um, which again is, is more evidence that we shouldn't be putting so much emphasis on student evaluations. But I recognize that not everyone can say the same thing and get the same result out. Okay, so we had a new building, and you guys are getting a new building, and we're trying to do more active learning, and you guys are trying to do more active learning. Um, but I want you to take a step back and say, okay, let's say, let's say you convinced me to, to do some of this or to go in a new building and, and teach there. What are we actually aiming for? Like, what is success for you personally? And so thinking if, if you're an administrator versus if you're an instructor versus, versus if you're a teaching center staff, what is it that you are trying to get out of this? So I'll give, give, give you maybe a minute or two to, to jot some notes down and then you'll so you've got lots of, of really good ideas for here's what success means to me. What I want you to do is in your groups, pick one of those ideas and think about how am I going to measure that we have achieved success. So it's, it's fine and dandy to say we're going to do more active learning and we're going to have a, a nice new building, but what is the impact of the active learning? What is the impact of the, the nice new building? Because oftentimes if you look across the country, Universities are doing innovative things. They're having new programs, they're having new spaces, they're having new activities for students or faculty. And usually you'll read about these new things and they'll say, and it's really good. Because the building is new, and it's pretty. And active learning is good, and the building supposedly supports active learning. But how do you actually show it with data? How do you actually demonstrate that this thing that we set out to achieve is, is happening? And so thinking about it in the context of the, the couple uh, points on, on number three, so what is the setting that you're going to look at this particular measure of success? What kind of data do you think you want to collect to see whether that is success has been achieved and what sort of analysis might you do? So pick one, one idea that, that your table had and collaboratively build that uh, experiment. So what we're All right, so I'm going to, I know you haven't solved the world yet, or the problems yet, but I'm going to stop you now. Um, originally, I was going to have the discussion of, well, one group, share what your question is and, and how you're going to answer it, but I think we're still stuck on the question of how do we actually define success. So can I get some ideas? How do, how do you, in, in your personal opinion, how do you define success for whether it be using active learning, whether it be opening a new building, whether, whatever whatever it may be. How do you think we should find success? And I mentioned to you already that we better start measuring how these, what's the success, what's going on in these classes now that we'll move into that building mm -hmm. so you can see what's the delta in right. the process. Yeah, so I think um, one advantage, well, I mean, we had the advantage too. We knew the building was coming online years before it actually came online. Uh, but I didn't know I'd be in this role and, and Whoever, I mean, my role is brand new, so there wasn't really a person before me to start thinking about these. But you have the ability to say, well, we know a building's coming online in two years. Let's start collecting some data today. Um, that's not to say that you can't do the same thing once the building does come online. You still have plenty of traditional classrooms that you can collect data from. But you do have that ability to say, like, I know we aren't doing this for a few years from now, but we could start collecting X, Y, and Z, whatever that means. The other thing I want to mention on that is, so, as a biologist, so I was trained as a, a, a bench lab biologist, and so my thinking about education research was the same as a typical bio. Well, you need the control. You need this exact thing where you take this student and you make them do this, and you take that exact student and make them do this instead. And so you, that is a mental shift that you have to be okay with, that a lot of my colleagues will say, well, what you did isn't real research. You didn't take the identical twin of that person and make them do something else. <laughs> and so you do have to get more into a social scientist mind state that, that that's okay, that things won't be exactly the same, but you can set it up in a way that, that it's as close as we can possibly get. I mean, that's all I can frame on that. Every time I suggest something new, one of the things my colleagues say is, well, how, how do you know that that is going to succeed or that that will work? And one response is, whoever measured that the current thing works? Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 
That yeah. could be a that's, t-shirt. Well, sure we did. We graduated a student and they yeah, got a job. Okay, so how else, how might we define success for whatever it is that in the active brain realm? What is success to you? We swirled around a bunch of different things, but we started looking at uh, uh, how students are differentially succeeding within the, the course or the department. Um, and that can be, you know, what are the differences in their grades or what are the differences in their continuing through that major or taking on that major or their attitudes towards the discipline. Yep, so you could measure academic outcomes, you could measure, measure attitudes, and you can see how do different groups of students do academically, what do they think about the class, what do they think about the environment, and so having student demographic data is really powerful to enable you to answer some of those questions. How else might we define success? I mean, um, we had brought up some of the, I, I don't know the full terms for these, but like the Baxter Golda learning dispositions framework. Um, sort of how students move from believing they're receivers of knowledge from instructors mm -hmm. to being sort of constructors of knowledge. Yes, yeah, stages of intellectual development. I don't know if there are measures associated with those frameworks, but like that would be, I think, a goal for an active learning classroom is to make you an owner of your own learning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I don't know specifically whether there are existing instruments. I imagine there are. But that's another great point that as, as the campus starts to think about we should measure X, Y, and Z, again, from the STEM perspective, think, well, we know everything, and we're just going to create this thing, and it's going to be perfect. All of this, most of this already exists. So K-12 literature has a ton of this information, a lot of this stuff in higher ed, uh, in, in other disciplines. Taking a step back and saying, well, maybe I don't have to create this brand new thing. Maybe we can use something that's already been validated and, and adapted for our purposes. So making sure you have a broad group of stakeholders who are participating in this. So it can't just be, well, all the biology faculty are going to get together and they're going to figure out how to measure sense of belonging in their classroom because we're biology faculty we know everything <laughs> recognizing that other people may know this stuff already and, and, and taking advantage of that let's get one more one one more idea of how how we define success for these endeavors um, we were thinking uh, kind of also about constructing knowledge but um, what would that mean in the classroom setting so thinking about a students both feel like they can contribute in class, but also do they actually contribute in class? Right, so this idea of, uh, again, the student's role and what they're getting out of it, but also specifically, did they learn something? Did they learn more than maybe in a different kind of environment are, are valuable things, and, and really a lot of the impetus for why we do this. We claim that active learning is gonna make them better students, they're gonna achieve better outcomes academically, whatever that means, and so defining that and thinking about that. So let me take you through some of the things that, that we thought about in terms of research questions. And again, the way we did it is not the way you want to do it. Like, we sat down a few months before and said, here's what we should look at. And over the course of this past year, we recognized that we need to adapt a lot of these questions, a lot of these surveys that we're giving out, a lot of the ways that we're trying to answer them. Uh, but we thought from both the instructor and the student perspective. So one of the things we thought about is active learning actually happening in our brand new active learning building. And uh, attached to that is this idea of, is it happening more so than in a non-active learning building? So the second part of the question, we're just starting to collect data on now, um, but we did a lot of classroom observation data in the new building that I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, how does it impact instructor decision making? So if you're an instructor going into this new classroom, how does it impact what you do both before you actually start that term as well as during the term? Um, from the student perspective, does it impact student attitudes, it, it, whether or not you have an active learning instructor versus a non-active learning instructor? And then similarly, does it impact student performance? And so there are a whole lot of different ways that you can measure these things and a whole lot of different types of data. And so I'll talk about the first three. The, the last question we're actually looking at in terms of uh, long-term historical data. So we're saying, once we have enough classes, we're gonna see how do students perform in these particular classes versus how they performed historically in those, in those same classes. And so that's sort of the economist perspective of how you answer a question like this. And so we're waiting to build up some of our, our, our stores of data, getting more classes in that actual building. But I'll, I'll share a little bit about one too. So 
we collected a, a whole bunch of data. Uh, so course and instructor demographics. Uh, we did a lot of classroom observations. Uh, we've done some instructor surveys and interviews, and from the student level, grades, demographics, as well as surveys and interviews. And so this question about well, what's happening inside the classroom, uh, we're measuring with a tool called COPUS. You guys use COPUS on this campus? A little, a little bit. Um, there's a, a few different uh, protocols for how to collect classroom practice data. COPUS is a commonly used one in STEM. Uh, the way COPUS works is you have 25 codes. And those 25 codes are either what the instructor is doing in a given time, a uh, given period of time, versus what the students are doing in a given period of time. It's broken up into two minute intervals. So every two minutes, what is the instructor doing? Every two minutes, what are the students doing? And, and at the end of every two minutes, you sort of restart the clock and then check off here are the things that, you, that are being done. So what are the things that, that a, a student or an instructor could be doing? So students are listening to the instructor, uh, they're thinking about things individually, uh, they're working in groups, uh, they're asking questions of the instructor, uh, they're taking a test or, or so on. As far as what the instructor is doing, the instructor could be lecturing, uh, they could be writing stuff on the board, uh, they could be asking a clicker question, um, they could be uh, guiding students through some sort of active learning task. And so COPUS is built for STEM courses. The, the S is STEM. Um, we use it campus-wide in, in all disciplines, and we found that it's generally okay for all classroom types. We have noticed that there are some things that come up, uh, particularly in the humanities and the arts that aren't covered by COPUS. So, for example, like a student's painting something. Like that, there's no real thing for students painting something. Or oftentimes in the humanities, what happens is that you have students come up and they actually lead a discussion. And the question is sort of, well, how do you code hmm. that? So we're actually looking on our campus about uh, creating a modified version of COPUS that's more amenable for the humanities. Um, but for the most part, it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, the way you collect this data, or the way we collect this data, is using a tool that comes out of UC Davis called GORP, which I don't remember, <laughs> I don't remember what GORP stands for. But basically what it is, it's a, uh, a platform that you can use on an iPad or, or on your laptop. And every two minutes, you just push the button. And that way you don't have to sit there and check things off. It also means you can download it in a spreadsheet after to more easily analyze what's going on. What I originally was going to do, but we're not going to do now because we're shorter on time, is I was going to have you sort of focus a little snippet of a class yourself. And um, so if you look at this, it's, it's fairly daunting. 25 different codes. And there's a whole lot of training that goes on before we send students out to do this. Um, but another way you can look at it is there's, there's been a condensed version uh, by the same person who created COPUS to begin with, and so she clustered these 25 codes into eight different codes. And so uh, when we analyze our data, often we're using these eight condensed codes as, a, as opposed to 25. So we'll skip this activity. Um, let me tell you about the data that we collected. So um, in winter and fall of this past year, we collected about 180 classroom observations. Each class received, received two observations, and then we averaged the, the COPUS codes over those two classes to get the profile for that campus, or for that course. Um, this in itself was a, an adventure. So basically, we, we told instructors, we're going to come to your class, and we're going to take note of what you're doing in the class. We made it very clear it wasn't evaluative. We made it very clear that the, the student coming in wouldn't be uh, interrupting anything. They'll sit in the back. They'll be quiet. They won't talk to anyone. And I hadn't thought about this at the time when we said, I thought, oh, this will be fine. We're just sending people to, to and, and for the most part, it was fine. For the, the overwhelming majority, I would say 98% of the, the emails that I sent out went either great, feel free, or, or they didn't say anything. There were a handful of instructors that came back saying, um, well, no, because either my classroom is sort of a sacred space that only invited people come into. Uh, uh, it's this, some people said, well, I don't like, you were too rude in telling me you're supposed to ask me and not tell me that you're coming in. There was the idea that 
uh, students might be scared that something they say is going to be leaked out. Um, and I think this is really, again, goes to the culture of the campus. The fact that it's only happened with 2% of the classes um, versus a, a much bigger chunk, I think, shows the, the culture we have on our campus that, yeah, my classroom is a space that anyone can come into. Um, but we do have those folks that are like, my classroom is a secret place and no one can come in. Which, to me, seems foolish because the students aren't recognizing that, right? Like, if you say something stupid, your students are going to tell people. They're not going to say, well, they, they said it in a sacred space. So. <laughs> but that in itself, I think, um, I, don't, I don't think I really appreciated at the time where I said, oh, we're going to... Like, there's the logistical challenge of how are we going to train all these students to learn how to cope this? How are we going to figure out their schedules to get them in there? But the instructor piece is something that I don't think we completely thought about when we started. But it, it has gone perfectly most of the way. Could you assess the scale of like numbers of students that you needed to train in order to be able to pull off? Uh, so it wasn't a lot. So I think maybe five students we had and a couple staff that were doing it. The training itself isn't too daunting. You can train in about an hour. Uh, and then you have a couple observations where they'll go in pairs or they'll, they'll go with someone else uh, who's more of an expert in it to make sure that they're getting similar ideas there. But it actually wasn't, I mean, I wasn't the one doing the scheduling, so it probably was harder for the person actually doing it. Um, but it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, it was, it was okay. Um, so of the courses we observed, uh, about half of them were large enrollment, greater than 100 students. And we specifically picked classes of uh, 60 students or higher when we started this. About half female, about half of them are certified. Uh, a little less than half were research track faculty, and about half of them, a little more than half, were STEM classes. And so what we did, so Cameron DeNaro in our Teaching and Learning Research Center performed K-means clustering of the data to see where do these different profiles, where do these different courses fall in terms of their their teaching profile. And she identified three different clusters that we're presenting here in, in radar plots. So the way to look at these plots is, uh, here are the eight codes, condensed codes, that, uh, that we, we are using. And depending on where this dot is, that's how many, what fraction of a given course uh, across these courses is, is doing this particular thing. So in, in this cluster, cluster one, 80% uh, of the time in a given class, the instructor is guiding that that button is pushed on the, on the GORP platform. Or maybe, in this case, 40% uh, of the time students were receiving information. And so what I'd like you guys to do in groups is to look at these three profiles, and, and based on what these codes are, how would you classify what's happening in each of these types of classrooms? Okay, so I'm gonna cut off the discussion again. Does anyone have a guess for any of them? Pick a cluster, how would you define Working. What's going on in that cluster? Problem solving or something. Versus cluster number three is lecture. Cluster number three is lecture. So it's almost exclusively instructor presenting as well as student receiving. And then I think we figured the difference between cluster one and two is primarily um, either students working in cluster one or the students talking and having more discussions. Okay, so cluster one has a lot more students working um, and a lot less student talking. And so how we defined that was that this was our active learning one. This was more of a Socratic lecture where it's a back and forth between the instructor and the students and then the traditional lecture. Does the red line mean that most of your classes were traditional? Uh, so if we look, so the ends are here. So 93 of our, so about 50% of the classes were traditional lecture. About a, a third of the, the remaining were active learning, and then a fraction were more Socratic. And so we then wanted to say, okay, we have these different clusters. Are there specific factors that predict where a given cluster is going to fall? So we did a logistic regression. We we're looking at what are the odds of a particular, particular class is going to be falling in cluster one, two, or three. So we, our variables were whether or not the faculty was active learning certified, whether it was a male or female, whether it was a research or teaching professor, whether it was a large amount versus small, whether it was a STEM or a non-STEM course. Uh, does anyone have any predictions about <laughs> which of these factors <laughs> might, might dictate? Hopefully the training. Hopefully the training. Active learning. We held our breath on that one, so hopefully the training leads you 
more likely to be in the act of winning. What else? Male faculty more tending toward a lecture. Ah, male faculty more more likely to be lecturing. Okay. I think class size. Class size, large enrollment, maybe less likely to do active mm -hmm. learning. Teaching more likely. To Teaching faculty more likely to do active learning. So what do we find? So these are odds ratios. So basically, it's saying that. Active learning certified faculty is 2.3 times more likely to be found in the active learning cluster and 0.38 times as likely to be in traditional lecture. So that, that was a huge relief. <laughs> what are we doing this for? Um, a couple of the, the other ones we found, enrollment size, seems to be predictive and that's not necessarily surprising. With large enrollment, it's less likely to do active learning. Uh, a couple other things though, we noticed that teaching faculty wasn't a significant predictor of whether or not that you're being active or not. Um, and based on the way that we hire our teaching faculty, that's not particularly surprising. Our teaching faculty are hired because they have a PhD in, in a particular discipline, and they've taught some classes. <laughs> that's pretty much what the typical department looks for when they're hiring teaching faculty. They want someone that looks like me, but they've taught some classes and they think positively of students. There's no necessar not necessarily any expectation that they are experts in terms of research towards education, that they have uh, received specific professional development opportunities or things like that. So it's this idea, well, you kind of like the teaching stuff more, but you're still an engineer, so we like you. We're gonna hire you in our department. Um, and uh, we have a couple NSF grants really looking at the impact of teaching faculty. Uh, that is separate from all this, but that isn't really surprising to us. So, STEM courses are 1.4 times more likely to use group work and 1.2 times more likely. Right. So they're less likely to do Socratic, which is which is sort of what we anticipated before that Socratic is more likely to be in the humanities than the, than STEM courses. Is there any kind of overlap where you can figure out um, whether certification? made it more likely for you to do academic <coughs> in a large course? Or is that yeah, so we could do an interaction term in our mm -hmm. model, which I don't believe we've done yet, but we can definitely look at that. Curious. Yeah, I imagine it would be the case, but we haven't looked at that yet. Yeah. Question? Back. Yeah. Do you view um, active learning as uh, more successful or equally successful with Socratic lecture? So that's an interesting question, the, the Socratic, whether or not that's active in so Socratic, by definition, by my personal definition, is not the same as Socratic and active learning are not the same. Because in a Socratic lecture, one student is engaging with the instructor, not the whole classroom. Now, humanities faculty will swear that their students, while Socratic lecture is happening, the other students will be jotting notes down and, and thinking about what these individuals are saying. STEM faculty, I don't believe my students are thinking at all when I'm talking to one student. <laughs> so, and I don't, I don't have any evidence. Well, so I have anecdotes so that no, there's no object permanence. That, that, that is an interesting point, and I think it does have to do with the fact of what is everyone else doing while this discussion is happening. If they're truly sitting down and jotting down, well, I think that was a good point because of X, Y, and Z, then that is active work. But if they're like, okay, when's he talking about the next slide, that's not active. Is when you look at whether or not something is a Socratic lecture versus traditional lecture, um, are you able to parse out? Um, is it just they're asking a question, that's the right answer, let's move on, or is it actually more of a discussion? Uh, so it's something we, in theory, could do, but that's not something Copus captures. Mm -hmm. So Copus just says, is this thing happening? Not specifically what's going on while it's happening. So students. The student working button could be, you're sitting there talking about a movie you just saw. You're working, you're not working on topic. And the other thing is that COPUS isn't evaluative. So like you could be doing a clicker question really poorly, but you still get a clicker question. <laughs> so that is, that is a limitation. So the most significant thing in here is the enrollment size, right? It's the class yeah. size. And so there's an important, well, hmm. To which extent does your institution take that as a as a kind of question mark about should we be running big classes? Like if you really believe in the value of active learning, and active learning basically doesn't happen 
in large classes. Yeah. Therefore, okay. so like, what do you conclude from that? So like, we're going to do it for the one. Anyway? So right, this supports the fact that that active learning currently is not happening in large classes to as much of an extent as the other. And there's a lot of things behind that, right? There's the instructor perspective that, well, I can't possibly do active learning. So we can make change there. We can convince these people mm -hmm. we're teaching it. From the institution perspective, it's my understanding that that's not even a discussion that will ever happen. We have large classes, period. Now what can we do? So that's something when, when instructors say to me, well, we shouldn't have big classes, I say, you're right. But <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to run through the rest to make sure that those of you have to leave, uh, get to leave, but I'd be happy to answer questions after. Um, another thing we looked at was we interviewed instructors to say, what sorts of changes and how did this impact what you do in the classroom? And so this is something that you can do on your own time, but thinking about, okay, at some point you're going to be teaching in a, in a building for active learning. How is that actually going to change what it is that you do from that quarter compared to a previous quarter? And so what we did was we interviewed a handful of faculty that were either teaching or research faculty and were certified or not certified. And so what Matt did was he uh, created an interview protocol that looked at a variety of things. How did faculty modify the courses? What influenced those decisions? And what did they think was the impact in terms of their students as well as like, other instructors? And he created this framework, this idea that, well, there's stuff that are out of uh, an instructor's control that are in the environment, whether that be what you can do in the classroom, <coughs> that the institution believes is important, uh, your students, Things that the instructor controls, what they believe learning is, what they believe should be happening in a classroom. And this idea that we take these ideas, we use them to, to decide to do something in the classroom, and then uh, there's this feedback loop where we say, okay, based on this experience, here's what I'm going to do next. And so we are particularly curious about learning about what is the impact of a building. And so we asked, well, how did you change your course? Uh, in general, our faculty said they did small changes. Uh, mostly they were looking at things inside the classroom, which makes sense. You have a, a different physical classroom for your lecture. You're going to change things in the lecture. Uh, they did try to incorporate more group work, um, and they changed what they physically did inside the classroom. Everyone mentioned that they were going to walk around, or they, they walked around more than they did previously. Um, some specific things they pointed out about the classroom itself. Well, this is a room made for the instructor to walk around. If you sit in the middle of the lecture hall, there's no way the instructor can get to you, but here you can literally walk up to every student that they recognize that as a benefit of the, the room and the layout. Uh, another mention, so in, in the big lecture halls, you can swivel in the chairs, so you swivel in the chairs, so now the students can form these mini groups, making that effect. So they immediately notice, well, the, the room itself is different, so we can do things that aren't physically possible before. Um, they noted that this teaching in this classroom shifted in their minds what actual teaching and learning was. So this instructor said, I remember I'd always take the information from lecture, go to the library, and that's when the real learning happened. What this style of teaching is trying to do is make the lecture more of a learning moment for the students. So recognizing that maybe what they should be doing inside of the lecture should be different. And this, uh, this same instructor said, well, uh, I organized the lecture to write on the board. That's how I did it last time. But that's not what this room is made for. He had to shift within that given quarter, so we only have 10 week quarters, he decided two or three weeks in that he was gonna change what he did because what he typically did wasn't working. We noticed that the instructors gave different responses to the building based on whether they were a teaching faculty versus a research faculty. Uh, I'm a teaching professor, I was hired under the impression I'm a good teacher, I guess under the impression that I'm a good teacher and interested in teaching. Last year I heard when help was coming online, I thought I have to get in there, you're the teaching professor, you're supposed to be doing the new stuff, right? But the impact of the building was different depending on who the instructor was. And they also recognized that this was something that is, is beyond just what the students and the instructors do. It's, it's a signal from the institution. It signals that this mode of teaching uh, versus lecturing is important. The institution is inventing and investing in that and signaling their students uh, the skills and interests that they're taking away and getting out of their degree matters. So it really is this perceived as a symbol that we actually care about teaching. Now, symbols are incredibly important. The fact that, that the institution, before anything had, has happened in there, before any classes 
have taken place, there we told everybody about this building. We had this big grand opening and all the news stations came and things like that. The, I forget whether Janet Napolitano came out. I think maybe she came out to, to attend this grand opening. Um, it was a big thing and, and it really was a symbol to outside as well as inside the institution that this is something that we value. Um, and we also rec we found that instructors made changes quickly. So again, this instructor that said two weeks in, shoot, this isn't working. I have to reinvent what I do in the classroom. And so I think, oh, and then this one, we hear this a lot. I don't want to leave out, so if I can go back to the over, <laughs> And that's something that we, we are getting some feedback that, hey, this isn't what we want to see. Um, so I think what we, we found interesting was that when we thought, well, what is the impact of the building? We thought there's a couple ways that it's going to make. So one, the physical things are different, so it's going to allow for other, other activities. Um, but also the perception uh, of the environment. But we found that actually it changed a whole number of other things as well, that it was a signal to the instant, that the institution believed a certain thing about teaching, uh, this idea of uh, change what they felt actual learning and, and teaching was, as well as what the role of the instructor was. And so we're trying to unpack this a little more um, in, in terms of how it's really affecting our faculty. But I think this question is interesting because for our Active Learning Institute, it's all about active learning. There's not that much about the building itself. There's a little bit about the technology in the building. We have fancy screens in there and things like that. But we don't spend an actual, uh, a lot of time saying, okay, active learning versus active learning in the building. And so I think what we're getting out of this is that active learning in the building is really about this mental barrier. I can't do active learning because of ABC. And the, the, having that sort of building and having those sorts of rooms lowers that activity. And I think that in itself is really valuable too. I'm going to stop there. We did measure some stuff through surveys and things like that that I'd be happy to share. Um, but I would say if you take away anything from this, it's that you will have a new building in, in a couple years. <laughs> so using that to your advantage that, hey, if we really want to measure the impact of this, if, if I really want to see how I as an instructor might going to change, if I want to influence other instructors to change, what sorts of steps should we put in place? <clears throat> I know the best laid plans and all that, but you do have that opportunity that we had and we didn't take advantage of as much as, as we probably would want to. So I would encourage you to sort of think about that in concrete terms. Thank you for your time.